before we introduce new material, uh, let's have recall what we have learned on Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday, uh, we start from the shear model. And we understand the shear model deliver uh, quantum numbers for us. That means the, the quantum number has uh, all the electrons has four quantum numbers. That's the fingerprint of the uh, individual electron. And so we understand the, um, uh, the quantum number is like this. So you have N, L, M, S. So all the quantum numbers like uh, can, you can regard, you can think of quantum number like a, a train tracks. And this will be easier for you to understand uh, what's going on with these four quantum numbers. So the first quantum number is, is about the size, the size of the atoms or the size of the uh, elect electron between the electrons and nucleus. This first, uh, first quantum number we call principal quantum number. The second quantum number is about the shape. The shape means that it's the uh, spherical shape or is an elliptical shape, or it can be more complicated. Right? This is called angular momentum. It's regarded with the shape. The third quantum number is regarded to the magnetic. I hope you still remember there are three limitations of the uh, of the uh, sum of, uh, of the uh, uh, Bohr atomic model. Right. The first limitation is what you know. Uh, <clears throat> You know, there's a fine structure. Remember, there's a fine structure uh, in, the, in the red color. So actually, there's a split line in the red color when you, use, when you have the spectrum of the hydrogen using a gas discharge tube. That's the first limitation. The second limitation is that when you apply the magnetic field in the gas discharge tube, you can see that the, the spectrum splits. The split on split, that means that the energy split. The energy split means that your energy level can be divided from one to two, uh, to three, to five. Well, that's, that's what we call magnetic field. And the third limitation is also related to the, the energy splitting, which is you apply electrical field to the gas discharge tube, and you can find out that um, the spectrum split. Again, the spectrum split means the energy split. The energy split means what? Means the uh, means you have many many different energy levels. Okay, so this is the uh, quantum the third quantum number called magnetic, and we use m instead of the uh, to represent this number. The th the fourth number is called spin. You have spin up and spin down, or you can call it clockwise or anti clockwise spin. So all the all electrons are, in, are identical. You cannot have exactly the same. Uh, you, you cannot have exactly the same uh, uh, electrons. That's what we call quantum number, right? So this uh, you need to remember this quantum number. Okay. So this is the summary for you to digest. And after that, we learn electron configurations, and this is the. Alpha, this is the principle you need to remember. Alpha principles, there are four rules in the alpha principle. Okay, there are four rules. I hope you remember this. We introduced this to you on Wednesday. The alpha principle, there are four rules. The first one is electron fielding sequences and energy. You know, electron, you know, this is energy state from zero to minus the highest. So the energy states like this 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4d. 4s, 4p, 4d, 4f, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the the important thing is how are you going to put the electron into this electron state, into this energy state? What are the rules you need to follow in order to put the electrons in this state, in this energy state? Okay, there are four rules. The first one is an electron feeding sequences energy. You need to put the electron according to the energy. The, you put the energy to the lowest first, for example, 3p and 4s. You don't put the electron to the, f you don't put the first electron in the 3p. No, you cannot, because you need to put the first electron into 1s. That's one. The second one is 
is party exclusion principle. The party exclusion principle tells us that each energy state need two electrons. And then one need to be spin up, one need to be spin down. So there's no identical, exactly same two electrons. So if you put one electron here, the next one you need to put is spin up. Next one you need to put is spin down for the electrons. This is the third, the second part, second rules, which is party exclusion principle. The third, the third, Hunt, the third is Hunt rule. Hunt rule tells us that once you put, you fill up the electrons in the one s orbital and two s orbital, and next one you need to put, uh, you need to put electron into into the two s orbitals. And then what happened? If you have first electron, you put it one here, and what happened to the next one? How about the si number six electron? Are you going to put it here and make it spin down, or you could, you're going to put it into the another electron level, energy level? Hans rule tells us what? Hans rule tells us that you need to put it into the, the next energy level, right? Okay, after you fill up all the three, only one electrons in these three electron level, uh, energy level, and you put the first one back to this, uh, the, back to this, uh, this, this uh, energy level. I make a quick, I make an easy example for you, right? When you go on the, when you get on the bus, and there are two seats for one bench, right? There are two seats for one bench. In general, uh, in general, you want, you don't want to sit some, you don't want to sit, when you sit, when you go get onto the bus, you see somebody is occupy one seat. And for common sense, or in general, you don't want to sit beside him. Right, you want to find a a, a chair, a, a bench which has nobody stay there, nobody sit there. Okay, so this is the, the easy way for you to understand the Hans rule. The, the fourth one is called N error rules. N is first principle. Uh, first, uh, N is the principal quantum number. Error is the second quantum number. So you put these two together, then you need to you need to know the energy level. For example, three P four S. 5s. Uh, sorry, 3, uh, 3d. Uh, sorry, is 3d, 4p, and 5s. This d is two, right? P is one. S is one. So if you get this together, three plus <coughs> three plus two, that means five. Four plus one, that means five. Five plus eight. Sorry, what? Well, sorry, this is one, one, right? And then two, three. So this six, six, six. So if you have a six here, am I right? And so this is zero, 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 one, two, zero, one, two, right? Okay, so this is five, five, five. And when you have five, 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 this number together is called energy rules. Energy rules tell us that what? You need to put the energy level three first, and then four and five in order. Three, four, five. This is energy rules. Okay? So, and, but if you don't understand this, there's a Christmas tree for you to know that. Remember? You can find this the Christmas tree. And it's easier for you to follow these rules. If you don't understand this, and this is NL rules. Okay. And then I hope you remember on Wednesday, uh, this year, the Nobel Prize winner in physics goes to, to the study of electrons. Okay, these three great scientists they found out they use the auto second laser to find out the motion of the electron which is very good okay what's the auto second auto second is one to minus 18 second which is very very short very very fast and very short laser and they can use this data to to, to realize the motion of the electron okay so they uh, they say in in the Nobel Prize, in the website, exploring the world of electrons. Okay. So if you have some good idea, please come to me. Let's work together. Let's re do research together. And let's get Nobel Prize together. Okay. Just joking. I think, I don't think I have a chance to get Nobel Prize. Unless you have a very extremely nice idea. For example, you find out that you, you got a laser which is much faster than this. 
Okay, if you find a laser which is much faster than this, and that will be another story. We can do some research together. Okay, so uh, today we are going to talk about quantum quantum uh, wave mechanical model, and I hope you still remember we introduced some of you to you on Wednesday, which is the first one is De Broglie matter wave, right? So we already know this, and we find out that if you derive equations using a wave mechanical model of the electron, you got this, you got this equation. However, uh, and we regard, uh, we use, this is a wave behavior. And the beauty thing for this is that Bohr atomic model also in, in the postulate number, number five, you also got this equation. So you think these, these two equations is exactly the same. So no matter you regard electron as a wave or no matter you regard electron as a particle, they, they, the, they, give, they give you the same equation. So that's the beauty of the science, right? Okay, and then that I give you an example of the wave met, uh, metal waves in, in the huge uh, bulk materials, you cannot see the wave because what? The wave the wavelength is too 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 large, uh, too small. You cannot see. However, if you use a small electron, you'll be able to see. You are able to find the the wavelength which is uh, capable of detected. Okay. And this is the wave behavior. So today we start from here. Is that you know. Um, to see some objects or matter has a behavior of wave, the most important experiment is called interference. The interference will tell us that if you have a slit or you, if you have a gap before the wave, and if the gap and wave are very close, the wavelength of the, and also the gap are very close, then you will be able to see some of the deflection, or you can call it interference. And this kind of phenomena tell us that this matter or this object has a has a character of wave. And this is very important. Okay? So you, you cannot explain this by particle like properties. No, you cannot. So the important thing is photon. Can we use photon as a object and to find out the, the wave behavior? Yes, we can, right? When you are in high school, uh, you have you know, this is a candle and you have a two slit. This is called double slit experiment. And you can, you can find out the interference or we call it diffraction, interference diffraction. So this tells us that the photon has a character of the wave. That's for sure, right? But also photon has a character of particle. That's also for sure, right? So interatomic spacing is about a few Armstrongs. So let's you, so in this case, this is light. Right, the visible light. I want to ask you: Does anybody want to tell me the the way the range of the wave the wavelength the range of the wavelength in visible light? What from what nanometer to what nanometer? Anybody want to tell me? Zero point five. Yes, please. Thank you, thank you. The four hundred nanometer to seven hundred nanometer. Right? How about the energy? Anybody want to tell me? How about the energy? What range? Use unit of electron volt. You know, if you follow einstein planck relationship, yes, please. Thank you. 1.8 electron volt to 3.1 electron volt. That's the range of the visible light, right? That's energy and wavelength. Because this is easy because if you use planck einstein relations, right? Easy. Anybody want to tell me what's the equation of the planck einstein relations. Anybody want to tell me? E equal to what? E equal to what? Yes, please. Huh? HF, HF, uh, yes, 0 0.5 point, okay? Thank you. But I want to use the unit of electron volt and the nanometer. Anybody want to tell me? That's more easier. Yes, please. E to into E. Thank you. One uh, one thousand two uh, uh, one hundred one twelve thousand 
，特特斯拉哎，一二四零零嘛，一二一二四零，哇 ，twelve hundred 哎，一二四零零吗？没错吧，一二四零零对 ，OK 啊 ，twelve hundred， twelve thousand four hundred divided by lambda in the unit of nanometer， right？ Okay, good, good. Thank you. This you have, you have to put this number in your mind, and don't forget it. Don't forget it. Okay. So don't. Okay. So after you finish this course, after three months later, this number is still also important. Okay. Right. So how about X-ray? X-ray. The wavelength of X-ray is much smaller. Am I right? Yes. So if the X the the X the wavelength of X-ray is much smaller, can we use X-ray to do the experiment? Yes, we can. So let's uh, let's think of the X-ray. X-ray the wavelength of the X-ray is about well um, a few nanometer to a, a very very small scale, like I I mean uh, ten to minus three or four nanometers. Okay, but Let's 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 assume the nanometer is somewhere in the middle, which is about one angstrom. Why we choose one angstrom? One angstrom is about the size of the atom, right? The size of atom. So, you know, the the atom, the gap between atoms, there's a gap. Then we can think, well, that might be somewhere around one angstrom. Okay. So if we be if we put if we use X-ray and then to use X-ray beam to to shoot an object or a crystal, then the gap between the atoms has, you have a gap between the atoms. So you can find whether you have diffraction or not. So for example, this is atom. Uh, there's a gap between atoms, right? So you have X-ray to, to shoot, to the, uh, X-ray beam to go to the, this uh, crystal or this material. And you can find out the diffraction. This is called XRD, X-ray diffraction. And this is a very powerful tool for you to identify the materials like aluminum oxide, like copper. Okay? Most of organic, uh, sorry, most of inorganic materials you can identify using X-ray diffraction. Okay? And you put, you put your object here and the laser goes through here, uh, la uh, the X-ray goes hit the object and then you have a detector and you can find some patterns uh, just that you have a roughly idea this is the size of the x-ray diffraction because you have a human being here and you know the size of the x-ray diffraction uh, tool so x-ray so the photon has a diffraction character uh, photo has a behavior uh, can have a, a diffraction phenomena or behavior so how about electron? Can so can you use electrons to go uh, electrons to go to the objects? Yes, you can. But you know electron got charges. It's not like photon. Photon has no charge. So electron has charge. So um, you you can think of something else. So uh, in 1927, um, in the Bell lab, this is Davison and uh, Germer uh, confirmed that. The De Broglie hypothesis by electron diffraction. So De Broglie said that electron has a behave uh, has a character of of the wave. So somebody need to prove De Broglie is right. Okay, by experiments. And these two gentlemen, Davis and the German, they they use a nickel target and they have an electron beam to hit this. Uh, sorry, they have electron beam to hit the nickel target. And they have a detector, and they realize you can find depression, a diffraction pattern. So that means what? That means the electron has a character of wave, because you found the diffraction phenomena by this experiment. So Davis German experiment tells us that the demonstration of the wave part this has a, is a wave particle duality was important in the establishment. Of the quantum mechanics and the Schrodinger and of the Schrodinger equation, we are going to talk about Schrodinger equation very soon. But you know, 
Schrodinger equation is the major. The main thing for a Schrodinger equation is Schrodinger regard electron as a part as a wave, not particle. Okay, uh, Bohr regard electron as a particle. Okay, so this is an important tool nowadays for us to use to tell the uh, to to see. Uh, the objects in the narrow scale or in the atomic scale. This is called TEM, transmission electron microscope. Very expensive. And if you put a thing, if you put your unknown material into this chamber, you'll be able to see the diffraction pattern. This is diffraction pattern of single crystal. This is diffraction pattern of the polycrystal. We are going to talk about single crystal and polycrystal in chapter three. Okay, so don't worry about this. I just want to tell you that Electron beam shoot the object and then pass through the object and hit the screen. And if there's no diffraction pattern, you only see one spot. However, there's a, a diffraction. So you can see the diffraction patterns with many, many spots. So that means that diffraction. Okay. Thanks to this uh, great scientist, they got Nobel Prize in 1929 in 1937, in 1977, because of this, uh, because of this, this kind of discovery. Okay, another one is that, uh, JJ, I hope you remember J.J. Thomason. J.J. Thomason is the, he create a model of what? Prompt putting model for atomic hydrogen. I have, sorry, for uh, this atomic model, the J.J. Thomason. He, but, of course, I told you that he doesn't get Nobel Prize because of this, because that's not a correct model. <clears throat> but he got Nobel Prize because he uh, he re he he, he uh, discovered an electron. An uh, electron is a particle. And interesting thing is, uh, a decades a de uh, decades later, his son is G. P. Thomson and got a Nobel Prize. Thirty thirty almost thirty years later. He regard the electron as a wave, so he got the Nobel Prize. Okay, this is a very nice story, right? Father got Nobel Prize. Thirty years later, son got Nobel Prize. Right. Okay. So the second um, topic we want to talk in mechanical uh, in in the quantum mechanical model is uncertainty principle. Heisenberg. Actually, Heisenberg, he wants to measure, he wants to know the, the location of the electron at a certain time. And he also wants to know the speed at that time. So Heisenberg, he tried to do experiments, but he realized there's no tools can, you, can be used to realize what's the, where is the electron and when is the electron in that location and what's the speed of that electron. He thinks this is impossible. So he has an uncertainty principle. So, you know, when you observe something, it always involves exchange of energy. Why? Exchange of energy means that when you see the, the light, when you see the things here, that means what? Because we have light. If the light is off in this room, you see nothing. So there's no in exchange. So when the light, when I turn on the light here, and then the light hit the table, and table, the, the table, the light reflect to meet my eyes ball, so I can see something. So it's always any, always exchange of energy. So when you want to see something, it always related with the energy. So according to this point, so it's impart, so it is important to know that energy when you want to observe something. So that means it is impossible to deter. He thinks that uncertainty principle is that it is impossible to determine simultaneously both position and momentum. Momentum in this in this in this point, momentum is mass times velocity, right? So mass is a constant. So you can think that the position and the velocity of electrons or any other particles and a great degree of accuracy or uncertainty. Okay, so the observer, like, like 
somebody watching, observer is part of the observation through that interaction. So when you observe, you disturb. I make an example for you. When you read, when you, when you are playing games in your room, when you are in high school, what happens if your mother opens the door? You, you soon turn off the switch of the game, right? And you and let your mother think you are you are study, right? So your mother is an observer and she disturbs you to do something. Am I right? She disturbs you to do something. And you might say, oh, mother, please don't disturb me, I'm studying. Actually, you are playing a game. So let's that involve what? It, one observer, one is disturber. Uh, okay? And that involves energy exchange. Okay? And your mother might say, says who? You say, says by Hessenberg. <laughs> he's a great man. So he's a Nobel Prize. So please don't come to disturb me. I'm doing something. So when you observe me, you disturb me. And your mom will say, wow, my son did a great job. He knows the Nobel Prize winner called Hessenberg. <laughs> Just a joke, okay? No, you're a college boy or girl. You don't need to worry about playing games because your mother is not next to you anyway. Right, okay, so let's think of observation of electron in orbit. Let's think, of, let's think in this way. Again, when you want to observe something, it always related to the energy. So ob ob observation of uh, electrons in orbital require accurate capability in terms of energy. So you want to see something, you need to have precise energy to see something. Why? I'm going to tell you now. For example, this is an atom. Let's assume this is a hydrogen atom, the most simple case. And then you have an electron. This is electron. And you want to see where is this electron and what's the speed of this electron at time equal to t. Okay, at once that moment and you want to see where is this and what's the speed. Can you do that? Okay, let's assume this is uh, Armstrong is about this alternate is about one Armstrong. Why? Because this is hydrogen. And you know the 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 electron in hydrogen, what's the size, what's the distance between electron and the atomic uh, and nucleus? Anybody want to tell me? 0 0.5 points. Anybody want to tell me? You need, you need to remember three numbers, right? In a, uh, yes, in, a, in the Bohr atomic model. The first, radius. Second, energy. Third, speed. So I'm going to ask you what's the distance? What's the R? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, you don't need to remember that precisely, 0 0.529. You can just remember 0 0.53, that will be okay. 0 0.53 Armstrongs. Unless you want, to, you want to work in NASA, or you want to work in a very, uh, very um, uh, research center, which is something related with this kind of precise number. Anyway, okay, thank you. You know, I release a lot of points to you, and I want you to get a point aggressively, okay? So, uh, so by the end of the, the terms, you don't come and beg me and say, please, professor, give me some points because I want to, I, I will fail my lectures. Okay, at this time, at this moment, raise your hand and I'll give you a lot of points. Okay, so, so this is the distance between electron and the nucleus is about 0 0.53 Armstrongs. So let's, and then, and if you times two, that will be about one Armstrong, right? Okay, so it's something like this. So you can, you can assume your model is like this. So once you want to observe this electron, you need some energy. So where's energy from? I hope you remember it's matter, ele matter energy e interaction. I hope you still remember we have a topic of matter energy interaction. So let's say I have an instant photon. This is electron, this is photon. So this photon, what? How, what's the energy I need in order to take this electron out? 
And because I want to observe this electron, so this electron needs to be out so I can uh, observe it, right? Okay, so, so let's assume this instant, let's assume this wavelength of this photon is the same wavelength of the uh, same size of this electron. Can, can we do it in this way? Yes, we can, right? Why? Because, you know, when you, if the wavelength is too large, what happens? This photon cannot hit this atom because the size of the atom is too small. So the wavelength, if the wavelength is like this, it's difficult to hit this atom. Very less chance. But if you have wavelengths like this, that will be easier to, to reach this atom, to get the point, to get this atom, right? So that's why you don't want to use 1,000 Armstrong or 10,000 Armstrongs. So one, uh, one Armstrong is easier, has a great possibility to reach these atoms and to, to realize something. However, if you use this wave, if you use this photon with the wavelength of one Armstrong, what happens? Again, if you follow the Planck Einstein relations and use this equation, what do you get? Oh, I'm sorry, I, that 100, 1,240. <laughs> That's just, okay, so, so what, what do you get? The, inst the energy, instant energy will be 12, <coughs> excuse me, will be 12,400 electron volt. Can anybody tell me what's the number? What, what does this mean about this number? This energy is very, very huge. Why? In order to take this electron out away from this atom, how many, uh, what's the energy you need to take this out, to make this electron as a free electron? 13.6 electron volt, right? But you use this huge energy to take this one out. Does it make sense to you? No, it doesn't. It's like you want to kill a fly with a big hammer, right? If you have a huge hammer, a very heavy hammer, it's, you know, you, you just don't want, to, you, don't, you cannot use this big hammer to kill a fly, a fly, right? So this, you will destroy these whole atoms. It doesn't make sense, right? So the bonding energy of the ground, of, of the ground state of the electron is, Hydrogen is about 13.6 electron volt, which is much, much smaller than this one. So you cannot use this photon to, read, to, do, the, to do the experiment. Then how about, then you might say, well, Professor, yes, if you want to have a precise elect energy to, kick, to take this electron away from this atom, can we use, use energy which is 13.6 electron volt? Yes, we can. Then according to this equation, then you can realize what's the wavelength. The wavelength is much, much larger than one Armstrong. That means what? That means the wavelength is too large. It cannot reach this atom. It's, the possibility is relatively low. Okay? So, so no matter you change to, you change to, um, small energy or you change to um, short wavelengths of the electron, this two doesn't give you the answer. So the Hesemann tells us that it's, it is impossible for us to know where is the electron in this orbit, in this atom, in, in what speed, at what time. It is impossible, even though you can, you, you think of many things. So this means, this Heisman tells what? This Heisman tells that the deterministic model cannot be realized by experiments. So we can, we need to change to kind of probabilistic models. So we can guess where is it, uh, how possible that, old, that electron in what location and at what time. Okay, we don't we don't need to know the details. Just know when you are, you just remember one sentence. When you observe, you disturb. 
Okay, when you observe, you disturb, and you cannot know exactly the, the location of the electron and the speed of the electron at, at a certain time. So this is the equation, uh, the probability models. So the delta p is the uncertainty in the moment momentum of the particle. And then because the momentum is the time, is the speed times mass, and mass of the particle is constant, so that is the uns you can regard it as the uncertainty of the velocity. Uncertainty of velocity times uncertainty of the distance, uncertainty of its position, okay? And has to larger than h divided by two pi. Okay, so assume our uncertainty of position is one m strong. That means one m strong means what? It's somewhere around here, it's two times larger than this. If you put this here, then the momentum, the speed will be about 15% differences. So uncertainty will be about 15%, roughly, roughly. Okay, so you cannot get precisely the location of speed at a certain time. Okay, so this is the uncertainty principle, okay, by Heisenberg, the second one. Okay, the, th the third one now is most important, is that, you know, the Schrodinger, he's a PhD student. He, uh, he tried to about to finish his PhD thesis. He's struggling, he's worried he cannot graduate. Okay, so in 1925, uh, in the Christmas time, to the new year, he some, somehow he, he pop, some idea pop, pop into his mind. Okay, so Schrodinger took the De Broglie motion of the electrons as a wave and developed a wave equations for such a matter wave. So this is a great moment for, great moment for Schrodinger and for the human being. So the, the system of the atoms is that electron behavior as a wave and electron is bound and confined to the atoms. I hope you still remember. If electron in a certain orbital, it need to be a standing wave. Okay. So let's let's analyze a bound system called stream. You know now there's a there's a study called stream steam stream theory. Have you heard about that? Steam theory. Steam theory also called a theory of everything. That means that if you find out, if you realize this theory, you know everything in the world, okay? There are 11 dimensions. Now we live in a four dimension world, right? But in a steam theory, there are 11 dimensions. Okay, interesting. When I was a PhD student, I'm very interested in this, in this theory. So I, I went to library, you know, at that time there's no internet, so I went to library. And I found out theory, the book, the books of the uh, string theory. And it's a huge, there are many, many books, a huge series. Uh, series. And when I take the first book out, I give up. It's all mathematics. And easy for you to imagine physically what's going on. It's very difficult. There are, however, there are many, many smart uh, people. They are, they are working on this theory of everything. Of course, this is not in my area, okay? But anyway, the stream stuff from here is that when you think of the stream, there are two kinds of wave, right? The first one is called traveling wave. The traveling wave means what? This is called traveling wave. It's, it's not a standing wave. So you lose energy when the, the wave is traveling, right? So it's impossible to, to give a model for the traveling wave, but it's, you might, we might think of the standing wave, which is a bound system, bound system. So this is the first one. So if you have this circle, and you cut this circle and make it straight, so this from the, this n equal to one, and this string length, you can put a string like this and to make a circle, right? Okay. Okay. So you have this and this, you have an n equal to two, and you have a knot. I'm sure when you are young, you, you play something like this with, with a string and stick, uh, put the end of a string on the wall and you just put it like this and you can, some, you can get something like this, right? 
Okay, so n equal to 3, n equal to 4, etc., etc. So how can you divide this kind of model? n, 4, 5, 6. According to this, you can write model easily. According to what? According to the length and amplitude, right? Okay. So the model, the model of the stream as a simple harmonic oscillator, the solution will be like this. That's not difficult, right? Y equal to a cosine kx plus b cosine uh, sine kx. And k is this. And you have this here, the lens. So the model of the vibration that in that stream are quantified. Why? Because you have n here. So n, and this is x, right? Okay, l is the, um, you know the location, and you know l. So this is quantized. n can equal to 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. Quantized. However, the answer, you got, you got a multiple solution, right? You got a multiple solutions if you want to find out. So lay is a priority of the solution. So the answer is not only one. It can be two, three, four, five. Okay, the Schrodinger equation that, uh, you know, we don't have time to, to divide the equation from here to here. But in the end, Schrodinger, Schrodinger we, we got an equation like this, which is related with what? Distance and the time, okay? And don't worry about this. <coughs> we make it simple. <coughs> we, here, we make it simple for you. It's a wave function for one electron autons. This is wave function. <coughs> the, this is called sine, 1s. 1s is like this. This is wave function. There's no physical meaning. No physical meaning. <coughs> I hope you remember A0 is what? Because the ball, this wave function for one electron auton is, this can apply to the ball atomic model, right? A0 is 0 0.529 times 10 to minus A centimeter. Okay. So this side is 1s, 2s, 2, 2px, 2py, 2pz. You know, there are Three energy uh, three energies in the in the in the same energy level for p orbital. So there is a two p x two p y two p z. So ladies and gentlemen, I don't need you to remember this equation or or this one. Don't worry about this. This is not the scope in our lecture. The important thing is we want to find out the orbital shapes. So as I told you that there's no physical meaning for this, but if you have a, a absolute value of the side times side star, that's the proportion to the probability of finding electrons in a region of space. So this is the absolute, this of absolute value tell us that where you can find the electron and what's the possibility for you to find the electron in that place. And this is what they tell you. So this is called electron density function. This is called electron density function. And uh, if you apply electron density function to this equation, to 1s, you'll get something like this. Each dot tells us the probability to find electrons. So as you can see, in the center, it's easier for you to find electrons because the probability is high. This 1s. And because you can make these probabilities, what does it tell you? It looks, the sh it, it looks like the shape of the orbital, right? The shape of the electrons, uh, the shape of the autons. Okay, this is orbital shape. And this function we call wave function. Actually, wave function is kind of eigenfunction. Do you, rem do you learn eigenfunction in engineering mathematics? You did, right? You are going to have, you, you are learning engineering mathematics in this semester and next semester, right? 
So you will learn eigenfunction. Okay, eigenfunction is a you get multiple solutions. The solution you get is called eigenvalue. So I want to tell you is multiple solutions. There's not only, only there's not not only one answer. There are many answers, and they are all correct. So the solution of the Schrodinger equations give the per permit energy value called eigenvalue, and the va the the wave functions corresponding to the eigenvalue are called atomic orbitals. So this is atomic orbital. Okay. So what happened to radius probability 1s, 2s, 3s orbitals? So this is one. As you know that this electron probabilities and this is distance from the nucleus. So you can see that 1s is like this. 2s is like this. 3s is like this. I'm sure obviously you understand if you have if you add up these areas together, that will be equal to one because y axis is the probability. Okay? So when you when you see this probability, you can write down this physically. And one s it looks like this, two s is like this, three s is like this. So this is called orbital shape. If we tweet, if we this is two dimensional, if we make it dim three dimensional, and it looks like this. Interesting, right? Use one equation, sharing equation, and you can realize the shape and the size of the atoms. Okay? So 1s, 2s, 3s. Okay, how about 2p? This is s orbital, right? How about p orbitals? p orbital, you know, p orbital, you have three, uh, three directions, px, py, and pz. It looks like this. If you do, if you use shading equation, and the uh, electron density function. There are three energy states in the same label. Three energy states, Px, Py, Pz. And if you take a look of this in two-dimensional view, and then it looks like this. If you cut this y plan, x, x, y plan, you see one in the, on the top, one in the bottom. Here, I want to tell you that, you know, one direction has a two electrons. It doesn't tell us that electron A is here, electron B is here, no. It, it's an orbital here. So electron can be, can be anywhere in this place or in this place, okay? The differences of, in color is just tell you that, to tell you have a clear view of this. How about 3D? You know, 3D has five energy states. So this is, dxy, dxz, dyz, uh, dz square, uh, square, and dx2 divide, uh, minus y2. I should say minus dash. So you might say, well, Professor, how do you get this shape? By shading the equation, by simple calcu uh, by calculation. Okay? So if you want to find more orbitals using shading equation, Go to this website. You can see 1s, 2s, 2p, and 3s, 3p, 3d. You know, it's getting complicated. Getting complicated. Okay. Yeah, Schrodinger is a great man. He got a Nobel Prize. And we, he's the father of the quantum mechanics. So this summarizes the web mechanics we are going, we we talk today. Right, and uh, just for your information here, and I want I don't want to show. I think this is easy. This is easy. Okay, please read it by yourself. You know that the difference between the ball atomic model and wave mechanical model is like this. This is the ball atomic model. That the ball atomic model tells us that it's a one hundred percent of atom in this location. However, wave mechanical model, Schrodinger tells us that no, it's not. That we use a probability to demonstrate the location and uh, the speed of the electrons. Okay, so I think 
after this, uh, what I want to tell you is that uh, it's important to let you understand the difference between ball automated model and wave mechanical model. And there are four topics we want to talk about. The uh, we want to talk within ten minutes. That's electron energy state, electron configuration. You already know this, and stable con con configuration and uh, valence electrons. I will skip this. You already know this. We don't need to recall what you have learned. So I will skip. I will skip this. We all. I hope you remember this table. We already discussed about this table in the last lecture. This also I already told you. Okay, so this is the electron configurations. You know, we follow the Christmas tree, or N L rules, N plus L rules, right? Okay, so um, you know, each each electron configuration related to elements. So you understand, hydrogen is one s one, helium is one s two, lithium is one s two. 2s1, something like this. Beryllium uh, is 1s2, 2s2, and boron, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen. So all the electron configura configuration related to one individual are uh, uh, and are uh, elements. Okay, this is important, and I hope you remember this periodical table. We already told you 1s, 2s, 3s. Uh, 1, 2p, right? Something like this. So let's survey the elements, something like this. So according to, let's combine electron configuration and the periodical table. And something interesting we find out is that we find out that if we use electron configuration 1s2, this is, helium is stable, it's here. And then lithium, barium, boron, carbon, blah, blah, from here, Nitrogen, oxygen, fluoride, neon. We found out neon is stable. And go to the n equal to three sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, blah blah. And then go to argon. Argon is stable. N equal to three. The principal quantum number m equal to two. We found out that the krypton is stable. So these are all located in this look, this place. And interesting thing is that they have the same electron configuration, which are S two P six, S two P six, except this one helium. So this is we call stable configuration. So others they are not stable; they are reactive, or they are active. Okay, electron configuration is not stable apart from S two P six. And then we want to find out why they are not stable and why S2, P6 are stable. So this is what we call valence electrons and electron configuration. So we, and as a matter of fact, we realize the reason this element is not stable is because of valence electron. The valence electron is loose in unfilled shell, which is not satisfy S2, P6. So what's the valence electron? So field shells are more stable. That means that if this uh, antimony, antimony has five valence electrons, which this five valence electrons, inside we call the field shell are stable. They are stable because they are, the, the electron is enough, not too much, not too less. It's good enough. Okay, so only one, they are five, not stable. So the numbers of electrons in the outermost, outermost valence shells govern its bonding behavior. So this five will have, rela will have relations with other atoms or chemical reactions with other atoms. If they have chemical reactions with other atoms, that means what? They have a chemical bonding. So we call bonding behavior. Okay, so elements with the same numbers of valence electrons are, are grouped together in the periodical tables in the elements. I just told you, if you make take a look of the periodical table. For for example, carbon has atomic number is, is six. That means 
carbon has six electrons, right? So if you follow the um, alpha principle in the electron configuration, that will be a 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Then how many valence electrons carbon has? Four, right? Because 1s2 is the helium. This is helium. And there are four valence electrons. These four valence electrons are active with other elements or with other atoms and have a chemical reaction. So valence electron is related to the chemical reactions. So you are a chemical engineer. You study in the Department of Chemical Engineering. So anything related to the chemi chemi uh, chemical reactions in your mind is always valence electron, nothing else. Okay, it's not inner electron, it's not the electron inside. Okay, in general rules, atoms of the main group's elements uh, tend to react to form close and complete shell. So you want to be S2P6 electrons. Okay, this is what we call Arctic rules. Remember Arctic rules. Arctic means eight. Eight. Okay, Arctic rules seems the bounded atoms has or shares eight valence electrons. So this is what we remember, right? Okay, so how many electrons in the for the each elements? There's some rules for us to follow. This is periodic table. The valence electrons, the group one, this is group one, group two, three, four, five, six, 13, 14, 15 to 18. So group one, how many valence electrons? One. Group two, two. Group three to 12, uh, this is, we call modified D electron count method. So you don't need to worry about this at this moment. We are going to introduce you very soon. So this is modified D electron count method. And let's, let's jump to number 11, uh, 13. How many valence electrons? Three, right? Three. 14, four. 15, five. 16, six. 17, seven. 18. It's not eight, right? Okay. It is stable. Right, so you know the valence electrons, and this, the, these electrons are very active for the chemical reaction. Okay, let's take a look of the transition metal, modify the electron count method. So how many valence electrons for iron? We know iron has what? Iron has 26 electrons. And let's fill up this according to the energy, energy level diagram. Okay, let's put it in here. Let's put energy, let's put electron here, 26. So the first one, and you found the label, something like this. Okay, 26. So number one here, why? Because an electron has to feel, uh, according to alpha principle, electron has to feel in the lowest energy first, right? So this is rule one. Rule two is poly exclusion principle, right? Poly exclusion principle tells us one spin up, Next one, there's a space. You have to put it here, and it should be spin down, the second one. Okay, and then three, four, five, six. Six need to follow what? Hunt rule, right? The number six electron shouldn't be here. It need to be here, Hunt rule. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. Okay, so can you tell me how many valence electrons? If I, if, I, if I show you the energy level diagram like this, could you please tell me how many valence electrons of the ions, how many? I just told you the valence electron is, is the definition of a valence electron is the outmost shell. The electrons in the outmost shell. So how many electrons? Valence electron. Six, right? Six. This is outmost shell. So there are six valence electrons. Okay? So even though you write down something like this, but actually this is the valence electron. 
So the number of the electron in the in the atom's outermost valence shell governs its bonding behavior. Okay, this is called modified D electron count method. Right. So valence electron is related to electric electrical conductivity. Why? Because these five are very active for the antimony. So this five, if you take this electron away from the atoms, it becomes free, free electrons. So it can be more conductive, right? Electrical conductive. Electrically conductive, sorry. So the, the valence electrons are also responsible for the electrical conductivity of elements, which may be divided into metal, non-metal, and the semiconductors or metal load. Okay, it related to what? Annihilation energy, right? This e electron, if we take out these electrons to the, to the infinite space, and this is called ionization energy. And this energy, this electron will be called the free electrons. A free electron is related to electrical, if we apply electrical field, free electron will become conductivity, right? So we know that all the metals are good conductor. That's, that's because of free electrons. Okay, and uh, I think I will just skip this because the, the ground state, uh, valence electrons, you know, many physical and chemical properties is related to the valence electrons, especially chemical, right? Right, so uh, I think I will just stop here. Right, I think we finished the topic of this, the first topic of the electrons. And, you know, we don't discuss somewhere uh, something inside the nucleus. And you know, in 20, 2013, the Nobel Prize in physics go to this Hinkes boson. Hinkes boson is the uh, the primary particles in the nucleus, but this is out of scope of our lecture. I don't want to discuss about this. And actually, in fact, I don't know about this at all. But anyway, I just want to tell you know that we don't discuss something, the particles inside the the nucleus. We only discuss the electrons, okay? And then next week we are going to talk about periodic table. From this, we'll start from the small scale, from the atom to the molecular, and from molecular to the crystals, okay? Right. So that's it for today, and I hope you enjoy the lecture today. I will see you next week and have a nice weekend.